Hello. Today's lecture will be fairly short. We will be talking about types of computers. Uh, specifically, we will be discussing embedded computers, and we will discuss how embedded computers relate to the issue of owner control. Uh, owner control is uh, a measure of how much control you have over a computer that you own. Um, how much you get to, to decide what to do with it versus, um, say, the manufacturer. So let's get started. Embedded computers are by far the most common type of computer in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, one sp specific type of processor used in embedded computers is the ARM processor, ARM. Uh, originally that acronym stood for ACORN Research Machines. Um, this one specific processor type um, is more common, there are more of them in the world than there are all desktop and laptop computers combined. Um, now, I chose the most common embedded processor, uh, but there are others. And if you add them all together, they are just, they are everywhere. Um, most embedded computers are less powerful uh, than non-embedded computers, uh, but it's a diverse group. Many embedded computers are high-powered. Um, they take as much power, um, are, are as good at processing or as fast uh, as typical um, server or desktop computers. Uh, for instance, the machines the computers that uh, are inside cell phone towers uh, that um, connect to cell phones and route their calls uh, and take care of uh, maintaining the radio signal and everything like that, uh, that's a pretty um, intense job. Uh, so those computers, uh, even though they're embedded, they're not, they're special, they have specialized processors, they're not just normal servers, uh, they do qualify as embedded computers. Um, they um, are as powerful as uh, a non-embedded computer. Um, or more, uh, they're better at their job uh, than a normal computer would be. They have specialized processors. And this is very common in embedded computers to have a specialized processor. Uh, one example would be uh, the computer processors in cable boxes. Um, if you have, you know, a, a little box that you rent from your cable company, well, that box is in charge of uh, decoding video, which is a pretty uh, in pretty resource-intensive task. Uh, but the processors are. Uh, cheap and low powered and the reason they can be like that is because they're specialized. They have special hardware devoted just to decoding video and so those computers in cable boxes can decode video very quickly and uh, can't do anything else very fast at all. Uh, but this keeps the cost down. This keeps the cost of cable boxes down because they can use these uh, low-cost processors. And low-cost is another typical characteristic of embedded computers. Not all. The cell phone tower computers, you're going to have to pay a lot for those. But many embedded computers are made by obsolete factories. Uh, when, you cr when you build a fabrication plant for computers, um, what you typically uh, it costs a lot of money, um, and you want to get as much use out of that plant as possible. Um, but many companies, it costs so much money to continuously upgrade a fabrication plant that they can't do it, and that the fabrication plants become obsolete. 
um, but the companies don't want to shut them down because they spent so much money on them in the past. So what often happens is that these obsolete uh, plants will make embedded computers. They might start making desktop or server processors and then because the company isn't willing to invest resources to keep it current, it, uh, the fabrication plant then changes to making embedded computers, maybe cell phone processors. As it gets more obsolete, it might uh, switch to making processors for, say, automobiles. Um, and then finally, right before it shuts down, it might make uh, processors that go in um, like things you wouldn't even consider a computer, like uh, maybe uh, maybe like a cordless phone. And because these uh, because there are so many obsolete factories around uh, making these embedded processors, uh, you can often get an embedded processor for really cheap. Uh, there is a product called the Raspberry Pi uh, that's out there and it is it contains a processor uh, with a video optimized coprocessor so the Raspberry Pi's processor is very good at decoding video um, and beyond that uh, it it's fairly low powered more you know it's um, maybe the Raspberry Pi is about as powerful as a cheap cell phone would be today but you can get it for $35. Um, so that's really nice. Actually, you can get it for, I think you can get it for $25. Uh, but that one has some stuff cut off. It's uh, n The $25 one isn't as full featured. Anyway, you, m you might want to look into it if you want to play around with a cheap computer. Um, people, people will buy these, uh, you know, computer people, like geeks, kind, kind of, will buy these um, these Raspberry Pi computers and use them in things like uh, um, they'll use them in, like, to control a coffee maker or um, just anything. Um, they're useful. Take a look at them. Um, anyway, uh, the relation, there is uh, a relationship between the operating systems that run on desktop and laptop computers and the operating systems that run on mobile phones. Um, Windows Phone is a version of Windows. iOS is a version of OS X, the Macintosh operating system and Android is a version of Linux. Um, so the three most common desktop operating systems are also the three most common uh, mobile phone and tablet operating systems. However, the order is exactly reversed. Windows is the most popular desktop operating system, followed by OS X, followed by Linux. Android is the most popular mobile phone operating system, followed by iOS, followed as phone. So it's kind of funny how that worked out. There used to be uh, other mobile phone operating systems uh, that only dealt, uh, that didn't have a desktop counterpart. Uh, Symbian is the biggest name there. Um, but those all have died out, basically, leaving these three. So that's all I have to say about uh, embedded computers. Um, so now I would like to talk to you about owner control. Uh, one uh, critical feature of general purpose computers, desktops, laptops, is that the owner has control over what software runs on it. Uh, you can install anything you want on your desktop or laptop, and you don't have to get approval from, every, from anybody. Uh, for instance, you don't have to call Apple or get Apple's approval before installing software on your MacBook. You can install Windows on your MacBook if you want. You can install Linux on it. You can uh, do whatever you want with your MacBook. 
and nobody's is going to try to stop you. Um, the software you run has unrestricted access to all features of the hardware. There's nothing that's being held back from you. Um, and so, in general, uh, the owner is in control. The owner can. The owner is in control of uh, the computer uh, that the owner bought. Um, this is not the case necessarily, often, uh, with embedded computers. Um, mostly, you don't have owner control with other computers, and you can't get it. If you have an iPhone, you are stuck buying applications that Apple has approved for purchase. Uh, and Apple will not approve applications that it, for some reason, doesn't like. Uh, Windows Phone isn't much better here. Uh, Android phones are the exception. Uh, with p any Android phone, pretty much, you can install uh, applications that have not been approved by Google. Uh, it's a setting in your, it's a setting in the menu that you have to enable uh, because um, just for security reasons to make sure you don't accidentally install a virus. Um, but you can do it. However, uh, these applications that you install uh, can't run uh, code uh, to do things that aren't exposed by the Android API. So they have to, uh, they have to run inside of the Android uh, sandbox. Uh, they can't do things that, that Android, the operating system, will not let them do. Uh, you can't replace Android, you can't uh, modify the Android to, to do things it wasn't designed to do. Um, so you still don't have complete control over your Android phone. The exception to the exception is Google branded phones, uh, the Nexus phones. If you buy a phone direct from Google, uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, Google will not stop you from completely ripping out the operating system and installing something else entirely on it, and people have done that. Uh, the most common thing people do is install CyanogenMod on it. Uh, CyanogenMod is spelled, uh, spelled like this. Uh, C-Y-A-N-O-G-E-N-M-O-D, Sandwiched Mod. Um, you can look that up if you want. It has uh, versions for several phones, uh, but Google phones are the only ones that uh, explicitly support it. Um, so you can get a cell phone that you control, um, but it's the exception, not the rule. Um, but what if you don't want to buy a Google phone? What if you have a phone and you like an, an iPhone and you really, really want to get full control of, of it? Well, often you can. Uh, this process is called jailbreaking um, because uh, you, the owner, are in a jail and you're breaking out of it so that you can do whatever you want with uh, with your device. Um, what jailbreaking does is use security vulnerabilities in the operating system of the cell phone or game console or whatever to bypass uh, the vendor's lockout code and gain full control of the device you purchased. Um, so Apple has uh, software that is designed to stop uh, to stop software that Apple hasn't approved from running. Uh, but if uh, you take advantage of a mistake that Apple made in its code, you can uh, bypass that code and uh, run stuff Apple hasn't approved. Um, now, these security vulnerabilities are typically patched by the vendor uh, shortly after they're discovered. Uh, so if you do want to jailbreak your phone, um, you should not. You should be very careful about installing software updates. Um, jailbreaking is often called rooting with Android phones um, because Android phones allow you to run uh, things Google hasn't approved anyway. Uh, 
but um, but you are not allowed to do things that uh, that Android does not give you permission to do. Uh, but you can do that if you gain what's called root access on the Android phone. Um, and so that's why it's called uh, jailbreaking on Android is called rooting. Um, as I mentioned, phones from Google let you do whatever you want, including uh, including rooting. Um, so if you have a phone from Google, you can that you bought from Google, uh, you don't have to use a security vulnerability to uh, gain full access to the phone. You can. Uh, uh, you can do that. Uh, Google allows you to do that uh, without needing to ex needing to do anything special. Um, what about non cell phones? Well, as I mentioned before, game consoles can often be jailbroken uh, to run games and other programs not approved by the vendor. Um, they use security holes just like with mobile phones. Um, but you know you're uh, dependent on somebody to discover uh, a programming error uh, to be able to get control of, of your device. Uh, so an interesting question is, you know, from an ethical standpoint, should the owner of a computer be able to do whatever he or she wants with it, um, or should the vendor of the device be able to lock out the owner and stop the owner from doing certain things? Some things to consider with this are um, some Android apps that require root uh, allow the owner to tether the computer to the phone uh, without paying for it as required by the cell phone company. So even if you have an unlimited data plan, um, Often, cell phone companies will want you to pay extra if you're going to use that data from a laptop computer. Uh, you can connect your phone to your laptop with a USB cable and tether it, but cell phone companies want you to pay for that. Um, Android apps let you uh, do that without paying for it. Um, is that good or bad? Well. Depends on what you think of the cell phone company, I guess. Uh, many game consoles are sold at a loss, at least at first. When they're first made, uh, when they're brand new, they're sold at a loss. Uh, but the way that the company makes money is through uh, the license fees that game uh, developers pay for the ability to run on the game console. So, when you buy a game console, the only programs you can run on it are games that have paid for the right to sell their game on that game console. Uh, without that, uh, without those license fees, uh, the game console manufacturer wouldn't be able to turn a profit, and you wouldn't have game consoles. Um, so that's another issue. Um, if you're buying something that was sold at a loss because you don't have access to it, perhaps you shouldn't have the right to get access to it. Um, Apple, on the other side of the fence, Apple uh, often uses its control over uh, the App Store, Apple's App Store, for iPhones and iPads and things like that. Uh, to exclude competitors. Um, so if you release an application for the iPhone that competes with Apple in some way, uh, Apple will just lock you out and not let you sell it or distribute it. Uh, so that doesn't seem right, at least to me. Um, and also, Amazon. Uh, Amazon has control over its customers' Kindles, uh, and Amazon has used that control to, ironically, uh, delete 1984 from its customers' Kindles, uh, because um, 
because Amazon didn't actually pay for the rights to 1984, they weren't supposed to, they weren't legally able to distribute it, and so when they realized that they were di distributing it in violation of copyright law, they not only stopped, but they uh, went into all their customers' Kindles and deleted the book. Uh, this caused uh, quite an outcry. Um, and after that outcry, uh, Amazon gave customers who were affected by this de deletion uh, a different version of 1984. They gave them a legally licensed uh, copy of 1984 for the Kindle. But, so the customers didn't lose out. But should Amazon have been able to uh, go into, you know, your computer, your Kindle, and delete stuff off of your Kindle just because Amazon made the Kindle. You paid for it, shouldn't you be able to, you know, uh, not have Amazon go into it and delete things. Um, so it's a complex issue. Uh, my gut feeling is that typically the owner of the, the owner of a computer should be able to decide how to use that computer. Um, but in markets like with game consoles, I can certainly see the other side. Uh, the game consoles are sold with the expectation that uh, you will only run games that have paid a license fee to the game console manufacturer. Um, cell phones, I see a little less reason for that. Um, you, should, you should be able to use your cell phone with whatever carrier you want as long as you fully paid for it and you know uh, honored your contract with the cell phone carrier if you got it for a discount in, it, in exchange for uh, exchange for a contract. Um, So I don't know. I don't want to say too much, but I would like you to think about this issue. And, you know, maybe, um, maybe look some su stuff up on jailbreaking. There's probably, almost certainly an Amazon, uh, a, sorry, not Amazon, a Wikipedia article on jailbreaking. I'm sure there is. Um, Okay, this is about the actually breaking out of jail, uh, use of jailbreak. Um, privilege escalation. Um, iOS jailbreaking. There's an entire article on uh, jailbreaking for iOS. Um, so this is pro this is a good article. Um, there's another article for Android rooting. So you can read as much as you want about this. Um, and as with chapter two, this could be the essay question. So, um, just read about it, you know, think about what you form an opinion, and, uh, I might ask you for your opinion later. Okay, that's all I, that's all I have for today. Uh, so have a nice rest of the day. Um, if you haven't done quiz one yet, uh, you should get started on that. If you don't have SAM access yet, uh, you really should get started on that. Um, contact me if you're having trouble with Sam in any way because it is very important you get Sam access soon. Um, and I will post another video for you tomorrow.